All right, guys. So for today's video, we're gonna try a different approach. Typically, you know, I do a bunch of B-roll and music, etc. Today, we are gonna do just hands, aside from me talking a little bit at the beginning and at the end of the video. Let me know what you guys think about this. It's a uh, different style, something I don't normally do. So if you guys are just about the hands and don't care about the rest, please leave a comment. If you prefer the other way, also let me know. Personally, I like the other way a lot better since there's more creativity and music and stuff. With that being said, uh, today we're gonna go over four different sessions that I've played recently on Hustler Casino Live that did not get covered in the vlog. I think you guys will enjoy these hands. I think it's a total of uh, 12 or 13, maybe even more. If you guys enjoy the video, please leave a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you're new, welcome. And that's all I got for now. Let's jump right into some poker. All right, guys, we are going to start the day off with a ridiculously fun hand, at least for me. In this one, Jabrail opens to 500 bucks. Patrick calls next to act, and I'm looking down at ace-king suited. I'm going to raise it up, of course, so I make it 2,500, and both of my opponents call. Three ways to a flop, which is what dreams are made of. Nine, six, deuce, all clubs, giving my opponent top set. Patrick doesn't have anything, but that's okay. Of course, I've flopped the nuts with five clubs in my hand. So Jabrell leads out for $2,500. Patrick folds. I happily call in position. Turn card changes nothing. It's the 10 of diamonds. At this point, he's only got around a pot sized bet remaining. So no surprise that he announces all in. I of course call right away. He wants to run it twice. I've got no problem with that. Luckily, we end up holding on both boards and just like that win a nearly $40,000 pot, which is really just a cooler. Interestingly enough, the next fun hand is against the same opponent with the same hand, ace-king suited. This time it's the diamond variety. He limps in from early position for 100 bucks. I make it 500. A couple of people call and when it gets back to him, he puts in the old limp re-raise. Makes it 5,000 to go. Typically, this is a pretty scary hand. As you guys can see, this time is no different. My opponent's got pocket queens, but I've got one of the best starting hands in No Limit Texas Hold'em, so I'm happy to raise it again. Being that he limp re-raised, I feel like calling and just going to a flop is also okay, but I'm happy to give this guy some action, even if I am behind. So I make it $12,000, gets back to him. He starts laughing a bit, thinks things over. As you guys can see, he's not entirely sure what's going on, but after some deliberation, he ends up just deciding to call, which... If I'm being honest, it's probably what I didn't want to have happen. Would have been okay with an all-in or a fold, but now we're going to have to play a flop, which does not help. It's queen high, but if I had aces or kings, I would continue betting small, and I think doing it with ace-king suited also makes some sense. So when he checks, that's what I do. Sadly for me, he check raises all-in, uh, and I was in pretty bad shape, so I let it go, and we lose this one. This next one is a lot less standard, I guess you could say. Dentist Dave opens in late position to 300, and then Jabrell, again, <laughs> battling against him, min raises on the button to 600. Patrick calls in the small blind, and I've got 9-7 suited in the big blind. Considering that the first raise was from late position, Dentist Dave, and then the button only min raised and the small blind called, doesn't seem like anyone's too strong. Sure, we could be up against it sometimes, but... I think this is a good spot to try to squeeze and capitalize on some dead money. So with 9-7 suited, that's what I do. I raise it up to $3,000. Dentist Dave folds, Jabril calls, and then Patrick calls as well. Not exactly what I was hoping for, but that's okay. Maybe we'll flop something. Queen 8-5, no spade. Not exactly what I was looking for. So when Patrick checks, I decide to slow it down a bit and check. Jabril checks it back, and uh, I think I'm okay with that. You know, we could always hit a six for the miracle. Turn straight, there it is. Out of nowhere, we end up making the best possible hand in a situation where I would almost never have 9-7. No surprise that my opponent in the small blind leads out for $6,000. Can't blame him. Patrick's got second set. I, of course, am going nowhere. Now it's just a matter of what to do with my exact hand. This is not exactly a situation where I'm going to pretend I'm super balanced or whatever. I min raise it up to $12,000 for the memes. Now Jabrail thinks it over for a while and it turns out my min raise was probably the perfect play because he turned a combo draw. He's got a straight draw and a flush draw to go along with it. He ends up calling the $12,000. Now Patrick announces all in for around, what, $45,000. 
Wow, action's back on me. I can't believe my luck. Seems obvious to me that both my opponents have something very good. That's exactly what you want when you've got the nuts. Problem with my exact hand is we probably need to dodge a lot of river cards, including a club and a board pair. Uh, so anyway, not like it really matters. I'm obviously going nowhere. I call. Now Jabrail thinks it over for a while. He's got $16,000 remaining. Seems really annoyed with this situation, and I don't really blame him. No one really likes putting their entire stack in the middle with just a draw. So after some thought, he ends up deciding to fold, which of course is great for me. Now we only need to beat Patrick at showdown. He wants to run it only one time. Of course, I'm happy either way. River cards a blank, the jack of hearts, and just like that, we end up winning an over $100,000 pot. So yeah, this stream is going quite well. Here's another banger of a hand. Jay Boogs opens from lay position, makes it 400 to go. Patrick calls it in the big blind. I call in the third blind with Jack-8 offsuit. Probably questionable if I'm being honest. GT also calls in the straddle and then Victor calls as well. He limped in from early position. So all that to say, there's five of us going to this flop which comes down queen, nine, three, rainbow. Patrick bets $1,000 and of course I've got nothing aside from a straight draw. So letting it go is probably the best play, especially when you consider there's three other opponents left to act behind me. But if I'm being honest, I'm feeling kind of good on this day, and I've got some evil plans for later in this hand. I suspect if Patrick had a hand like two pair or a set, he might go for a check raise. So I think his bet on the flop indicates just top pair, and maybe we can get him to full top pair later in this hand. I toss in the call with some evil intentions later on. Jay Books calls as well with his pocket fours, which is... Certainly hopeful on his end. Turn card is the seven of clubs. Now Patrick decides to check. I think this is a green light to start applying some pressure. I could have all sorts of two pair combinations considering that I was nearly closing the action in the third blind. And uh, let's be honest, if he's got top pair, it's not gonna be a lot of fun for him to hang on across multiple streets. So I put in a bet of $4,000. Jeremy gets out of the way. Honestly, it's kind of good that he called on the flop because it makes my turn bet look stronger since I'm now betting into two opponents instead of one. At least that's what I hope Patrick is thinking. Perhaps he's not though because he calls after some thought and we see the jack of clubs on the river. So no help to me. I mean, yeah, I've got second pair, but that's almost never gonna be the best hand. Patrick checks it again. And now we have a decision between checking back and giving up or going for it all. Well. If I was not bluffing, let's say I had a hand like 10-8 or maybe some backdoor clubs that now make a flush, I would certainly be betting quite big. So I think with a bluff, which I have in this case, doing the same thing makes sense. He's got around $30,000 remaining, which is a little over double the size of the pot. And that seems about right to me. So I move all in for his remaining $32,550. Of course, as you guys can see, my opponent rivered top two pair. And if I'm being real, I probably would not have gone for this if I knew he had top two pair. But uh, lo and behold, after about five minutes of a very stressful tank from Patrick, he ends up letting it go. And unfortunately, I have to show this one because we were playing a round of stand-up. Not really a huge fan of showing bluffs immediately after they happen at least, but whatever, part of the game. And with that, we move to the last interesting one from this stream. Straddle is on for 200. I raise it up with pocket queens. GT re-raises on my left. And when it gets back to me, I think putting in another raise is almost always going to be the play. But occasionally trapping with big hands out of position seems decent as well. So this is one of those rare times where I'm going to do that. We're also extremely deep. So the value of just one pair goes down a bit when you have a ton of money. I make the call and we go heads up to a good flop of 766 with two hearts. So flopping the over pair with queens looks like a safe flop. I check and he bets $3,000. Against some smaller sizings, I think I would check raise happily almost always, but I decided to just call and we see the jack of clubs on the turn. Not my favorite card as now we're losing to pocket jacks uh, as well. But for the most part, I suspect we'll still have the best hand, so gonna continue checking and calling any reasonable bet. This time GT's price is 5,500 bucks. I make the call and we see the eight of clubs on the river. Again, not a great card. Backdoor clubs arrive. If he has a hand like 10-9 suited that was perhaps bluffing, that now improves to a straight. Also pocket eights, although I don't think that's very likely given that he's bet the flop and the turn. So anyway, I check it a third time, and now he puts in a bet of $12,000, right around half pot. 
I don't know, not loving the situation. Doesn't seem like we're beating a whole lot at this point. And also, I'm not sure if GT would play any bluffs this way, at least not with these bet sizings. At the same time, I'm getting a very good price and could even beat some value bets such as Ace Jack suited or maybe a really thin bet with pocket tens. Who knows, GT is capable of putting in some mysterious bets from time to time. So when that's the case, I think just putting the money in is usually gonna be the best play, even though sometimes you can expect to lose. And as you guys can see, this is one of those times as my opponent has rivered a full house. So we lose this one, kind of kills the win in my sales, but still ended up having a good day. Let's move to the second stream. All right, on this day, we are playing 10, 20, 40. Yen opens to $110. Dentist Dave re-raises to 330 in late position. And I am looking down at the beautiful King-9 offsuit in the small blind. It's not every day you get monsters like these, so I raise it up to $1,400. And only Dentist Dave makes the call, so we're going heads up to a flop of Queen-Jack-8 with two diamonds. Typically gonna be a better flop for my opponent than for me, so I think with over pairs, it's okay to check them. With King-9 off, I'm gonna do the same thing this time. So I check it, not necessarily giving up on the hand, but at least just starting the flop with a check. Dentist Dave checks it back, and we get the dream on the turn. 10 of diamonds, giving me a straight and giving my opponent a set. Of course, it does put a one-liner to a straight and also a possible flush out there, but I don't suspect either of us will have a flush very often, so I'm happy to bet my straight for value. Put in 1400 bucks, Dentist Dave calls, and we get a blank on the river, the six of spades. I'm just gonna continue betting for value, this time $4,400. I feel like Dentist Dave could certainly have a hand like ace-queen, maybe two pair, you know, hands that'll call, but we're still ahead of. And sure enough, after some thought, he ends up tossing in the call, and we win a $14,000 pot after getting lucky versus pocket tens. In the next one, we get pocket kings. Don't need to get as lucky with these cards. In this one, there's a raise from someone, a bunch of people call, and then I raise again, I make it 900 bucks. Somehow all my opponents call, not exactly what I was expecting, but that's all right, looking for a safe flop. This one is overkill though, king, king, five. That's right, we flop quads. I mean, yeah, it's cool, don't get me wrong, flopping quads is always awesome, but in this particular situation, I'm not exactly happy with it because what the heck are we expecting to get value from? So I do the typical thing and check it. Action checks around, hoping the turn card gives someone maybe a full house or just something. Four of clubs, probably not gonna do it though. This time when the action checks to me, I decide to finally put some money in, $1,100, and only Veins makes the call in the big blind. So just two of us going to a river, which is the six of hearts. He checks again, I bet $4,400, and he doesn't think too long before calling, keeping me honest with his uh, turned pair of fours. Unfortunately for him, this time I've got it, and we win a nice pot. As you guys can see, it's pretty easy to play when you have a super strong hand. This next hand, though, it's gonna show how uh, not as easy it is when your hand is like medium strength. That was a weird way of saying that, but bear with me. So in this one, the $80 straddle is on. I raise it up with ace queen to 240. Francisco calls on my left and then Nate Hill kicks it up to $820. Dentist Dave cold calls and when it's back on me, I think ace queen is a really good candidate to put in the squeeze with. Seems like we've got some dead money in the mix, but for unknown reasons, this time I decide to take it easy and just call. Francisco gets out of the way, so we go three ways to a flop of queen, 10, six with two clubs. I've got the ace of clubs and of course, top pair, top kicker, so good flop for me. We both check it to the initial raiser, which in this case is Nate Hill. He's got ace jack suited and decides it's worthy of a bet. Don't blame him, he's got backdoor hearts and a possible straight draw, also the over card, so I guess his bet makes sense. 1200 bucks into the middle, and now Dentist Dave check raises to $4,000. Hmm, perhaps a bit concerning. I've got the ace of clubs, so it's a little less likely he's doing this with flush draws. But at the same time, I've got a queen, so I don't really see how he could have two pair. I guess queen 10 is possible, but you know, not very likely. Hand I'm most concerned with is of course pocket tens, which I do suspect he would play this way, but I'm not just gonna fold to uh, a single check raise. I've got top pair, top kicker, and I wanna see another card. So I toss in the $4,000. A little bit worried about what Nate is gonna do behind, but he ends up just calling as well. Not entirely sure what's going on. I feel like we could be in trouble against aces or kings from Nate. Don't really know what other hand he would play this way aside from the nut flush draw, but again, he can't have that because I've got the ace of clubs. Yeah, so I don't know, a lot of stuff going on in this hand, but either way, turn card is the seven of spades. Shouldn't really change much, but of course, as you guys can see, that means Dentist Dave has turned two pair. Now he jams all in for $14,000 and I'm in a really weird spot. 
I don't really know if Dentist Dave would continue bluffing after getting called by two opponents on the flop. But if he is bluffing, we're probably not even in amazing shape against those hands. Maybe hands like King Jack suited or, you know, Jack Nine of Clubs. Who knows? All sorts of stuff that's got a ton of equity. And that's assuming that we're ahead of Nate, which, like I said, he could have hands like Aces and Kings. Maybe even a set himself that he's uh, trapping with. So, uh, yeah, it's a close spot. We're getting a good prize, but probably don't have the best hand against two people. I don't know. You guys know, usually when it's close, I put money in, but for some reason this time I opted against it and made a, what I consider disciplined fold. Nate Hill also folds. So in the moment, I didn't know if I made the right choice, but looking back, I'm happy to see my opponent had two pair and we got away from it without losing too much money. Moving right along to stream number three, and we're going to start this one with another dream scenario. Tal opens to $300, Enrique on his left re-raises, Dentist Dave cold calls the re-raise, and then I've got pocket aces in the small blind. Yeah, stuff that almost never seems to happen, you know, there's all this action and then you get aces. Come on, that stuff never happens. I couldn't believe it when I saw the cards, but I'm just going to take it in stride, raise it up to $3,600. Now Tall thinks it over for a while and raises again. I think it's obvious at this point he's got either maybe ace-king suited or pocket kings. I don't even think he would play queens this way, but anyway, he kicks it up to around 10000 bucks. Everyone else folds, gets back to me, and considering that he's put in a pretty big amount of his stack, I decide to just get it in. And sure enough, he calls right away. So off to the races, I show him my hand, I ask him how many times he'd like to run it. He wants to go twice, twice it is. And we end up holding on both boards, so starting off this day once again on a good note, winning a $56,000 pot, which again is just a cooler, but I'll happily take coolers as long as they're going in the right direction. This next hand is pretty funny. Not a whole lot of uh, analysis to be had, but long story short, I ended up going all in versus Nate Hill, and we both had ace-king suited. He wants to just run it twice. You know, I don't really blame him. What's the point of going twice if we've both got the same hand? But what do you know, we end up making the nut flush as three diamonds come on the board. If that's not run good, I don't know what is. However, it can't be run good all the time, and this hand will exemplify the exact opposite. Straddle is on for 200. I raise it up to 500 with queen nine suited. Action gets to Clue in the big blind. He's got pocket jacks, worthy of a re-raise, so he makes it 2,000, and I call in position. Flop comes down king eight seven with two diamonds. He continues with a bet of 1500 bucks, and now it's up to me whether I want to raise and start applying pressure now or just call in position and see what happens. I think both options are totally fine, but this time I decide to just call and we see a bad turn card, the seven of spades. Clue checks it now, and I think it's super unlikely he's doing this with a hand that's just going to check fold. So instead of attempting a bluff that I think is probably burning money on fire, I just take the free card. And of course, wish that I had bet the turn because we make a flush, the Jack of Diamonds. Dream card, or so I thought, turns out it's a dream card for my opponent as he rivered Jack's full. Clue wisely checks it over to me, probably thinks that I've got a straight or a flush at this point, and he's not wrong. I put in a value bet of $4,500 targeting aces, ace-king, king-queen suited, you know, that kind of stuff. Unfortunately for me, after a few seconds of thought, Clue decides to check-raise all-in. <sighs> Not a fun spot for me, but I think it's most likely we're up against a full house at this point, so I decided to just let it go. Sure, he could have a hand like Ace Jack with the Ace of Diamonds or Pocket Aces with a Diamond that he's turning into some sort of bluff, but don't think it's too likely. Probably up against Pocket Kings or Pocket Jacks. And uh, luckily this time it's the right decision. We save ourselves around $24,000. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the last stream of this particular vlog. In this one, I've got Jack-10 suited. I raise it up to 300 bucks. Sammy calls on the button. Nick calls in the small blind. And then Lynn squeezes from the big blind with Queen-Jack suited. Action's back on me, and considering that we're both fairly deep, I think putting in another raise is probably the best play. Because if I just call, I give a good price to Sammy and Nick airball in the small blind. So yeah, I think re-raising or folding are probably the best options, but this time I decide to just call. Sammy calls as well, and now Nick back raises from the small blind to $12,500. As you guys can see, he's got a real hand, ace-queen suited, sets up the trap nicely pre-flop, and gets exactly what he was hoping for, I bet. Now it's on Lynn, and she ends up folding, but I've got Jackson suited, and I want to see a flop, so I call again. I've got position and a good amount of chips left behind, so if I flop something, could be a good situation. 
this isn't exactly advised if I'm being honest because my hand is pretty face up as a good but not great hand. That's not really something you want. But here we go, off to a flop which comes ace, 10, six, one diamond. So we've got second pair. Nick bets $10,000, right around a third the size of the pot. I call with my second pair and backdoor flush draw and get some help on the turn. It's the eight of diamonds, giving me more outs if we are behind. And it seems we perhaps are behind because Nick now announces all in for my remaining $68,000. <sighs> Probably the grossest spot from this entire vlog. And the reason I say that is it's really, really close. I've got $68,000 and the pot's got 116,000 in it. So I'm getting odds to hit a flush, but that's only if he doesn't have a set. And who knows, maybe we're ahead, probably not. I think it's very likely my opponent's got an ace. He might even be playing pocket aces this way. He might have ace X of diamonds, in which case I would be in really bad shape. I don't know. I mean, seeing the 60%, uh, 40% on the screen, I think uh, we lean towards call. But in the moment, I thought my probability of winning could be a lot lower than that. Yeah, it goes without saying that this one took me a while to figure out. In fact, it took me around four minutes, which is pretty embarrassing considering that I was playing on stream. I don't think it's a good idea to tank that long on a stream anytime. It's just bad for TV. But uh, this was a lot of money and I wanted to make sure I thought over all my options and the whole situation. In the end, I ended up deciding to let it go. Yeah, not exactly what I was hoping for when we uh, went to a flop. We ended up losing around $25,000 and yeah, this one didn't work out. Tough luck. Shortly after that hand, this one comes up where Masato opens late position to $300 and I'm looking down at pocket sixes in the small blind. My opponent doesn't have a whole lot left behind, only around $12,000, so I think my hand functions best as a raise. If we can get it all in against him, it's probably not going to be great, but also not the worst thing ever since I've got a pair. Anyway, I make it $1,800. Mike X is not interested in any of my fish analysis and instead squeezes to $5,000. Action gets back to me, and considering we're still beating ace-king, ace-queen, and some potential other bluffs, I decide to call and see a flop. 944 is uh, not bad for pocket sixes. If we were ahead pre-flop, we're most likely still ahead now. So when I check and he bets $3,500, I think you could go either way here between just calling or even check raising. Our hand could use some protection against ace king, ace queen, you know, over cards. And I think the smaller my pocket pair, the more I tend to want to raise. But if I'm being honest, this is kind of just a punt. After all the pre-flop raising that went on, I think it's most likely Mike is going to have a strong hand. And if I'm being super transparent, I probably just should have let this one go once he made it $5,000. It's just so tricky to play this hand out of position. But perhaps it was a bit of tilt from the Jack 10 and Diamonds hand. Perhaps it was a bit of overconfidence from everything going so well the last few streams. But anyway, here we are. I check raise to $10,000. Mike X, of course, he's got pocket kings. is going nowhere. Turn card, not ideal. It's the king of clubs. So now I'm drawing dead. But Mike wisely checks it back and gets the absolute money card on the river, the six of hearts, giving me a full house and what I think is almost always gonna be the best hand, unless of course we're up against pocket kings, which I suspect is the only hand that Mike could have that would play this way. <sighs> heartbreak, absolute heartbreak. He's got a little over a pot size bet remaining. If I had any bluffs, I would be jamming all in. Doing it with a full house seems rational as well, so that's what I do, and Mike cannot call fast enough. It's a cooler, yeah, but it's also one that I could have easily gotten away from with some sharper pre-flop discipline. I end up paying the ultimate price and lose an over $100,000 pot, but at least it couldn't have gone to a nicer guy, Mike X. And with that, we move to the last interesting hand of the night. In this one, I straddle for $1,000. We were occasionally doing $1,000 straddles around the table, and I had won a few of them. My policy with straddles is if you win one, probably best to post one later on. So I'm in the thousand this time. Action gets to Masato, who's got pocket aces and only $7,000 remaining. He jams all in there, and then Dentist Dave is next to act with his pocket jacks. He makes it $55,000 before I've even looked at my hand. What do I got? It's ace queen. I can't believe it. I've actually got a really strong hand in the straddle, and I think Dentist Dave could be jamming all in, or effectively jamming all in, since he put in over half his stack, in hopes of just getting me out with any two cards. 
This guy is not afraid of action whatsoever. So yeah, we could be behind sometimes, but could certainly be ahead and flipping against some pocket pairs. So this is a really high variance spot, not something I recommend doing often at all, but I decided to jam all in, obviously just targeting a big side pot against Dentist Dave, and if he could fold whatever he's got, that's obviously a massive win since he would forfeit his $55,000. Again, not advised against uh, any random player, but I have quite a history with Dentist Dave, and I know this guy's got gamble in his heart. So I do announce all in. Dentist Dave calls with his pocket jacks, which is not ideal. As you guys can see, I'm in terrible shape as Masato's got two of my outs, and Dentist Dave actually has a really strong hand. Again, kind of a punt, but I'm a lot more proud of this one, if I'm being real. We decide to run it twice. First flop comes queen high, so we end up securing at least half of the side pot. Second flop is king 10-7, so I've got a straight draw, looking for a queen or hopefully a jack. We could give Dave a set now, but we end up not hitting any of our outs and chop this massive side pot with Dave, and of course have to give Masato around $7,000. He earns himself a triple up, and to be honest, that was probably the best thing I could have expected from that hand altogether. $200,000 pot, and we only end up losing around 7 k Doesn't sound too bad. Anyway, that was the last fun hand of this video. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed. Right, so as you guys saw, a lot of tough situations, a lot of run good, a little bit of run bad. I feel like it was a good mix of everything you want from some interesting hands. As far as results go, I ended up winning around $85,000 across the four different sessions that you guys just saw. Unfortunately, the first three I won and I was up a bunch and then the last one, I ended up losing over $100,000. I think it was around 130 or 140. Unfortunately, that's my biggest loss to date of my entire life. So kind of rough, but that's how it goes. You know, I was on a really, really uh, good run up until that point. So I guess you could say it was expected since winning all the time is just not really a thing in poker. But yeah, I hope you guys liked the video, and if you want to see this kind of action live, this Friday coming up, I'm going to be playing Hustler Casino Live once again. I don't really play the Friday games too much because they're a little bit big, but once in a while I like to jump in there, and this Friday is going to be another one of those occasions. So make sure to tune in and check it out as it happens. If not, um, I'll cover this one, uh, this upcoming session in a vlog as well. So there's always that. All right, like always, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for the support. Again, let me know what you think of this video style as opposed to the normal one. And until next time, good luck at your local tables. Peace.